Hello, welcome to Devon Pond Plant's latest video. And today I'd like to talk to you about oxygenators because we probably get more questions about oxygenators than any other. Uh, they're quite a wide group of soft stem plants and I'm going to describe them all in detail about how many you're going to need, which ones to choose and what the pros and cons are of all the different types. So I think a good place to start would be what is an oxygenator? Well, when we're talking about pond plants, an oxygenator is a plant which grows with at least part of its foliage submerged underneath the surface of the water. I'm sure you remember from your school days that plants photosynthesize by taking sunlight and processing it through the leaves, and they use up carbon dioxide, and they release the byproduct as oxygen into the water or into the air. Now, obviously, in pond terms, a plant can only release oxygen into the water if its leaves are in the water. Therefore, the part of the plant that's out of the water is not contributing towards the oxygenation of the pond. And that's a good place to start. Very many plants are sold as oxygenators, but don't actually do very much oxygenating at all. And this is a source of some confusion. Here is an example. This is hydrocotyle. It's a very pretty little plant with tiny little scallop leaves and it grows very short and in a mat. And it can grow completely underneath the water, but as it grows these leaves tend to rise up on stems and sit on the surface of the water. Now those leaves then cannot be doing any oxygenation at all because any oxygen they produce is just going into the air. It's only the green material below the water that can transfer oxygen to the water. So where it's sold as an oxygenator, it's probably actually not contributing that much to the oxygen levels in your pond. By contrast, this is Potamogeton crispus, and it grows completely submerged. No part of the plant, apart from the seeds at the very, very top, will protrude from the water. All the leaves are below the water, and so all the leaves are producing oxygen, which is forced to dissolve into the water. So that is a true oxygenator. And what is typical of many oxygenators is they are quite vigorous. If an oxygenator likes your water chemistry and likes your pond and has the right conditions, it can grow pretty fast. And so some oxygenators have to be very wary of because they can be too vigorous for the size of your pond. Here's an example of an oxygenator which is probably too vigorous for your pond. This is Elodea, recognized by most people as Canadian pondweed, which is actually a generic term applied to very many species of pondweed that look much like this. Uh, for many years this was sold as Canadian pondweed or Elodea canadensis and it's a real nuisance in many ponds and waterways in Britain as a result. Uh, Elodea canadensis, oddly enough, has never been banned from sale and if you can get true Elodea canadensis it's perfectly legal to plant it and grow it. We don't sell it, haven't sold it for years because it is much too vigorous for the average garden pond. Only a tiny scrap escaping into the wild can mean that the river or pond is completely overwhelmed with it in no time. And while it's an extremely good oxygenator, you don't want it to be completely blanketing out all the wild and native species that there are. So we do not recommend you sell or buy Elodea canadensis and under, certainly under no circumstances get rid of it in the local canal or river or what have you. There is another species that looks very similar to this called Lagarosiphon, which was also sold up until recently, about five years ago. That one was banned, which just looks like a bushier, fatter version of this, and all the same comments apply. This here is Hornwort, which is a native plant, Ceratophyllum demersum, and it's a one oxygenator which is pretty reliable and doesn't generally give any problems. The reason for this is it doesn't ever make any roots, so it's not rooted into the bottom and just grows loose like this. So this is the oxygenator we often recommend. It's only available from about now, which is mid-May, through till probably the end of August. And this is, leads me on to another very important factor with oxygenators, is that they're all very strongly seasonal. So they only have a few months in which they're actively growing and contributing to the pond ecosystem. Hornwort, as I've mentioned, will overwinter as just this tiny little bud on the end, on the bottom of the pond. All the rest will die back and become brown and black, but it isn't dead. It just ceases to become active and growing. 
So by this time of year, it started to grow and we were able to sell it again. And that would be a typical size of a bunch. Now, people often say, how big is a bunch? Well, how big is a bunch of roses in November? How big is a bunch of roses in June? It depends what you're buying and when you're buying it. So out of season or at the end of the season, the bunches tend to be a little smaller, but that will give you a typical idea of what size a bunch of auctionator might be. The only auctionator available in winter and early spring is Calatricky. This is a bunch of Calatricky here, and this is just about in mid-May at the end of its season. So we won't be selling this for very much longer at all, because it will start going yellow and dying back, and it will start becoming replaced with some of the summer growing species. This is a very rapidly growing plant and will make big mats in the edge of your pond in shallow water. Uh, but the newts and frogs really like this one because it has very soft leaves in which they can wrap up their eggs. Frogs like to spawn in it, so do toads. And so it's a valuable contributor to the pond early in the year when almost nothing else is growing. So perhaps you might decide to have several bunches of calatricky and maybe some hornwort and maybe some milfoil. And I'm going to explain what all of these auctionators do when their season is individually. So to follow on from the question of what an auctionator is, uh, we are often asked, how many auctionators do I need? And of course, that's a slightly how long is a bit of a string question. It does depend on the depth of your pond and its general situation. But as a guide, you need about five bunches like this per cubic meter of water. And this applies mainly to small and medium sized ponds, not to great lakes and so on like that. But if you think of a cubic meter as being a thousand liters or 220 gallons, you need about five bunches like that per cubic meter as a good guide. One question we're quite frequently asked is, what do we do with our auctionators when we receive them? Well, most auctionators will arrive looking something like this. It's a bunch of the auctionator with a bunch of cut ends and a bunch of growing ends, and it's held together with a little piece of lead wire on one end. The lead wire is really of no use to you at all. We just use it for portioning purposes. It's usually insufficient to sink the auctionator to the bottom. And if you drop these auctionators in bunches straight into the pond, they will survive for quite a long time floating around, but most of them will eventually fail because they haven't been able to root into anything. So the best bet is to either leave the clip on or take it off and push these bunches into the bottom mud or plant them into a pot as you would ordinarily with a garden plant and then submerge the whole pot and plant in the pond. Then they will root from this cut end very quickly and they will be away. We do recommend that you maybe choose a bigger basket and plant four or five bunches in one basket. That way you get a nice bunch of foliage coming up. It's easy to see where it is, so it's not going to get accidentally lost when you're cleaning out the pond and that's what you do with them. The only one that you can just drop into the pond is hornwort because it doesn't make any roots. So the answer to the question that I'm asked almost on a daily basis at this time of the year, can you sell me something I can just throw in the pond? Yes, I can, that. But please don't throw all the rest of your plants in the pond and walk away. They do require a little aftercare to get them to look their best. Uh, broadly, there are three groups of auctionators you could think about. There are those which grow with most of their foliage exposed above the surface when you grow them in a normal way. This is Scirpus cernuus, Isolepis cernua, and it's normally grown to enjoy the foliage with a little sort of fibre optic effect on the top. So consequently, all this foliage isn't contributing towards oxygenation. It's only the green material below the surface that does, and that's very, very shallow. So it's not doing very much oxygenation. The deeper it is, the more oxygenation it will do, but the less attractive it might become. And this applies to various short species, such as the hydrocotyles, which form a floating mat, a little penny-shaped scalloped leaves and also to plants like Eliocaris. Now this one interestingly will grow completely under the water and at some depth if the water is quite clear it'll grow quite deep but most people plant it to enjoy the foliage. So again it can be an oxygenator but often isn't depending on how it's being placed. Then there are those which grow partly below 
and partly above the surface. So this is Hippuris, this is mare's tail, not to be confused with horsetail, which is a terrestrial weed. This is an aquatic plant, and normally you will see it with about that much material sticking out of the surface, the little sort of Christmas tree effect, and quite a bit of the material below the surface. Again, this will grow to quite a depth if the water is clear, and that's the limiting factor to many oxygenators. If they're planted too deep, they don't get sufficient light and they will fail. So if the water's cloudy, green or brown, uh, they won't grow nearly as deep as they will in clear water. And then finally, there are the ones which I've shown you before, such as Ceratophyllum, the hornwort, the milfoil family, and the Potamogetums, all of which grow with virtually all of the foliage submerged and just the tiniest little tip, which is a flower or seed sticking out of the surface in some cases. So these are obviously the ones that will contribute most to the oxygenation of the water. Right, now I'm going to do a more or less A to Z list of all the different plants which are considered to be oxygenators, and I'm going to explain a bit more about each one in detail. This one, you've seen me talk about time again and again. This is Ceratophyllum, which is hornwort. This grows on the bottom of the pond, and it just grows loose and doesn't make any roots and is one of the few plants that you can just drop into the pond and walk away and forget all about it. If it grows to unmanageable proportions in your pond, then you can just easily lift it out with a rake or a fork or something like that. So it's easy to manage and is recommended when it's available, which is about May through till the end of August. This is Eleocaris acicularis, which is a, a needle hair grass, and this will grow completely submerged in which case it's a good oxygenator, or it can be grown like this to enjoy the grassy bright green foliage, in which case it's not contributing much to oxygenation, just to the look of the pond. This is Elodea. In this case, this is Elodea natolii, but it's Canadian pond weed of one sort or another, and I don't recommend that you buy this, take it from friends, I recommend you get rid of it if you possibly can, and please do not put this out in the wild. It's an aggressive, non-native oxygenator. Very good at oxygenating, no doubt, but will take over a pond in no time at all. This is Fontinalis antipyretica. This is willow moss. This can be found growing in clear streams attached to boulders and larger pieces of wood and so on. And it's a good enough oxygenator, but is not suitable for the majority of garden ponds where the water is probably too rich and too turbid for it. We do sell it when it's available, but we don't grow that one here. This one is Hippuris vulgaris. This is mare's tail, not to be confused with horsetail, which is a terrestrial weed. This one can grow at quite considerable depths if the water is clear. Most people grow it in fairly shallow water so they can enjoy the Christmas tree foliage bright green in the spring and it's a good native oxygenator. This one is Liliopsis brasiliensis. As its name suggests it's South American in origin and it will grow as a, a short turf completely under the water. It will grow above the surface if you want it to, but it's very susceptible to being browned off by too much sun or strong winds or whatever if you do it that way. It's uh, well known by aquarium keepers because there's lots of species of this you can use in an aquarium to provide green material for your fish. So it's got a quite an attractive effect, but it's non-native, so we don't sell as much of this as we do with the native ones generally. This is a type of pennywort. This is hydrocotyle and in this case Hydrocotyle New Zealandii comes from the southern hemisphere so it's not native and it grows in a, a short mat with very attractive green scalloped leaves smells very fresh a bit like sort of watercress or mustard and cress and it's usually grown right up on the top like this in which case it won't be doing any oxygenation at all if you grow it a little bit deeper say under that much water the, the stems will come up and the leaves will float on the surface but the stem material doesn't contribute very much to the oxygenation so again this is a plant i would consider to be uh, more of a, a marginal plant and of interest rather than being a true oxygenator. The next group are the milfoils and they're called milfoils from the French milfoil, lots of leaves and so these are very good oxygenators, they are quite fast growing, they root and spread very rapidly into soil based ponds, not so much of a problem in a pond with a liner because they can't get their roots in very far, 
but they're excellent auctionators. This one is a native species called Myriophyllum verticillatum. Uh, we grow and sell a lot of this plant because it's a very good auctionator and very easy to establish. This one isn't native. This is Myriophyllum crispatum, and it's very similar to Hippurus and often confused with Hippurus. It's the same sort of Christmas tree look, uh, say non-native, but with reddish stems, not overly invasive, but again, because it's not native, it shouldn't be put into a pond which has a connection to the environment. This is Myriophyllum spicatum, spiked milfoil. For some reason, people always seem to choose this over Myriophyllum verticillatum, but um, it's really very little different. The leaves are slightly shorter and the set stems are more reddish. But this is another good native oxygenator, reputed to appear on its own in ponds that have just been dug out of a, an empty field. Um, so it may just indicate that there was water there once before in history. But again, spike milfoil, grown on the bottom, roots fairly well and is a good oxygenator. There are many other species, but these are the only ones you'll probably find commercially. This one is Potomageton crispus. It's variously called wavy pondweed, curled pondweed, and so on, but lots of pondweeds are called curled pondweed, so it's a bit confusing. But this is Potomageton crispus, a very attractive, bronze-leaved, crimpled edges, but quite difficult to establish in many static ponds. It used to grow when I had a fish farm years ago. This one used to grow profusely in all the channels and streams feeding the various ponds. But I've since been back there and there's no sign of it at all. And where it was growing here on my nursery, it's also disappeared. So it's one of these plants that tends to grow for a while and then mysteriously disappear. And I can't really tell you why, except that perhaps it just runs out of some micronutrient and doesn't um, grow very well thereafter. Nice one to try, but don't be disappointed if you can't get that one going. Another example of a plant which isn't traditionally considered to be an oxygenator is Potomageton natans. This is broadleaf pondweed, and this will grow in water up to about two meters deep with floating oval olive colored leaves and lots of stems from which new plants will originate. Uh, the stems underwater are green, so presumably they're photosynthesizing and releasing oxygen, so it's going to be doing some oxygenation, but because most of the leaf material is on the surface, that isn't contributing. This is quite a vigorous plant, uh, having said which, it's quite difficult to establish in small ponds. It seems to like large ponds with lots of soft mud to get its root, roots into at the bottom, and so when we sell it, we sell it with a little bit of the root attached to give you a better chance of getting it going. This is Ranunculus aquatilis. This is water crowfoot. This again is more of a riverine species. And in the rivers, it will grow very, very long, long strands with very long leaves, like, like string and maiden's hair. And the still of the water is the more the leaves get divided as it has here because it's growing in still water. And there's a form with little ivy shaped leaves as well. But um, we find that hard to keep going. But this is water crowfoot. You can see it roots all over the stems and it's a really good oxygenator for cooler ponds or shadier ponds. Doesn't much like hot, sunny ponds. So you'll tend to see it more in the spring and autumn. There's also this plant here, which is Newfar Lutea, uh, which is not traditionally considered to be an oxygenator, but it does actually contribute towards oxygenation quite strongly. These underwater soft lettuce-like leaves are great for newts to wrap up their eggs and also are photosynthesizing and releasing oxygen into the water. And when they're grown in deeper water, these things can just basically be like a cabbage sat on the bottom. They will only produce these surface floating leaves and flowers where the water is less than about a metre, a metre and a half deep. Uh, so these can contribute towards oxygenation without actually being considered to be an oxygenator in the general sense. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's talk about oxygenators. And if you want to have some more information about pond plants in general and how to build your pond, you could look at my book, which is called Ponds, a guide to construction and planting, and is available on Amazon and on our website and various other places.